This is Fresh Ed, a weekly podcast that makes complex ideas and educational research easily understood. I'm your host, Will Brem. Today, we explore the interconnections between educational assessment and inclusive education. My guests are Alison Milner and Ezekiel gomez Caraday. One of the most interesting aspects about doing a comparative study is seeing how these agendas have moved over time and space. And I think that's something that Felicitas Acosta refers to in her foreword, is this notion of as it moved, it more, essentially. We see here in Argentina a lot of resistance to this agenda. And one of the reasons, I believe it's a cultural one. Here, actually, as the States, we are a country of immigrants, and, and the notion of equality is it's really strong in Argentina and in politics. And the accountability and assessment agenda, to some extent, tends to classify people. Alison Milner is an assistant professor in the Center for Education Policy Research of the Department for Culture and Learning at Aalborg University in Denmark. Ezekiel gomez Carde is an assistant professor at the School of Education at the University of San Andreas in Argentina. Together with Christian Edison, Tali Adriat German, and Yu Jun Ruan, they've recently co-written the book Educational Assessment and Inclusive Education, Paradoxes, Perspectives, and Potentialities. Alison Milner and Ezekiel gomez Carade, welcome to Fresh Ed. Hello. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Congratulations on your new book. Really quite a nice contribution with so many really great authors. I want to just jump right into some of the content. Um, you, you bring in this book together sort of the assessment agenda and the inclusion agenda and then think through what these different agendas mean across many different countries. So I guess to start, how would you even begin to describe what the assessment agenda is in education? Having written the book now and having analysed the data, you could actually say that there are multiple assessment agendas. And this is actually one of the most interesting aspects about doing a comparative study is seeing how these agendas have moved over time and space. And I think that's something that Felicitas Acosta refers to in her foreword is this notion of as it moved it more, essentially. So, for example, if you're coming from England, you might set the assessment agenda within a much wider standards agenda that actually, you could say, started even previous to this more global agenda that is now seen through the international large-scale assessments such as PISA. You could trace this back to Margaret Thatcher and the 1988 uh, Education Reform Act. The political need for comparable data at the national level to ensure standards are maintained in schools and to ensure that England or the United Kingdom was competitive in a bigger global economy. So assessment became very important at that period. But assessment actually historically has been quite significant in England. Even before the advent of neoliberalism, we had um, IQ testing, we had the 11 plus, which in a very class-based system created the conditions for a kind of tripartite system of schooling, of secondary modern grammar and technical schools. Um, so assessment has always very, been very much a national concern, even before it became something that you could say has become quite global in its reach. Although maybe in Argentina, you have a different perspective on that, um, Ezekiel. Yes, yes. And it's very interesting because we are in the, in the opposite side to some extent. The accountability agenda is here perceived as a foreign agenda coming from the World Bank and coming from outside. We see here in Argentina a lot of resistance to this agenda. And one of the reasons, I believe it's a cultural one. Here, actually, as the States, we are a country of immigrants and, and the notion of equality is it's really strong strong in Argentina and in politics. And the accountability and assessment agenda, to some extent, tends to classify people. And that classification here makes a lot of noise. It's very uncomfortable for people. So during the fieldwork, we found a lot of resistance at schools, within in principles, but what they perceive as a global and not a local agenda. And so in Argentina, how did it move and morph into that context? Interestingly, we have standardized assessments, but if we have to track historically, they are very discontinuous and they are not high stakes, as they call. We don't have examinations when you leave the high school here or you don't have examinations to get into the university. So these exams are not kind of changing the lives of the students or the teachers or the principals. So somehow they are not shaping the educational realm as in other countries, as in England, for instance. Interesting. And yet still the language and the discourse is there. But whereas, Alison, in England, this sort of assessment 
and standards sort of agenda are shaping students and are shaping teachers? I think it's very much used in contrast to Argentina is as much more of a part of a social mobility agenda if you want to see that intersection with inclusion. You know, success in education as seen through examinations is your route to your role in society, your role in a labour market, your potential to, you know, overcome the disadvantages of your past and of birth, as Michael Gove might have said earlier on in, in the early 2010s. But yes, that has been, of course, challenged because obviously very few people do actually attain that kind of level of social mobility. The class structure, although maybe class consciousness is not necessarily something that is felt so much these days and it's often played down, there's definitely very much still a class structure in which education is built and develops and it does impact what examinations you take. The extent of your attainments within examinations can be reflected as a result of your socioeconomic background because all of these other things that you know these other resources you can draw on in your education that aren't actually present in school can have an impact on your performance in a performative test so yes I think this is something that actually we talked a lot about in our concluding comments actually to the book this notion of how assessment and inclusion are recontextualized in our contexts and what are the main kind of influences there and class and the socioeconomic environment of England has a huge impact on that, whether that be neoliberalism or more recent austerity policies, which have had an impact on child poverty levels and attainment levels at school. So it's sort of like this notion of as long as they're in, in England, what you're sort of saying is that as long as there's equal opportunity to get into schools, and the standards are sort of shared across the system, then it's really up to the student's own ability to achieve well on a test and then sort of progress further along in their education and that sort of quote-unquote perfect meritocracy. But of course what you're saying, Alison, is that a lot of this misses some of these class dimensions and that these standards don't sort of create this, you know, beautiful world of meritocracy as someone like Michael Gove. Now, Ezekiel, what about in Argentina? How does this notion of inclusion and notions of fairness and social justice fit into you know, this discourse of assessment, even if it is sort of being resisted, I guess, in a way, in Argentina. Interestingly, what we found in the book is that these agendas are tied together. And as I said, in Argentina, the assessment agenda is being resisted. The inclusion agenda is, we have the, the different scenario. Everyone embrace the inclusion agenda in Argentina. And we are pretty good in the schools, including all the, the students. And actually, during the COVID uh, pandemic, that of course was a, a disaster, a lot of programs used to go to the students' houses to find students. So we have like a mandate, a cultural mandate that everyone has to be at the school, no matter what. And that's a, something that all the teachers and all the principals in Argentina has believed that kind of that, that mandate. It's very strong that the inclusion dimension, no matter background, gender, ethnicity, religion, or, or whatever. So, of course, with the resources of the Argentinian educational system and schools, but no one questioned this uh, inclusion agenda here. And does the assessment agenda impact the inclusion? Yes. Let me give you an example. For instance, in a school, I had an interview uh, with a principal that told me that during this national standardized assessment, the apprender, the learning evaluations, the students somehow decided to strike out, to not to take the test. And the principal supported them and said, this is a, a very good example of civic engagement and how people voice, the student voices. So it was very interesting to some extent to see how the principal endorsed and support this position of the student not taking the test. And that was something very natural for them. It was not a huge thing because they perceived these examinations or this assessment as something that is not from the local communities. It's not for these schools. It's something for the politicians or for the World Bank or for they don't know what, whom. But yeah. I think that's the same in England also. I think also there is this feeling amongst school actors, so head teachers and teachers, that this is an agenda for somebody else, really. It's to compare schools. It's not necessarily about 
the kids and their educational attainment. But at the same time, there's less of a capacity to be able to resist within the English system because of the accountability system, which was, again, one of the key intersections for assessment and inclusion. And that feeling that, you know, during COVID-19, we ha- we also had experienced some quite interesting changes to the assessment and accountability system in England. But actually what came through, it was through our teacher interviews, was how complex it was and how actually the kind of shift to teacher's judgment, that sudden shift, actually caused many problems for teachers. And there was that notion of teacher bias um, that came through a lot in media conversations, in education select committee conversations, and how could that be somehow prevented. And teachers were really worried about how this would reflect on them, how their judgment was basically being made the kind of the crux of the accountability system at that point. So, and also what's really interesting is when we talk to people at Ofqual, how they say ultimately, you know, we have this assessment system. Um, and you might, you might disagree with what they say on this, but because it's based on the education system we have. If we have a different education system, we could possibly have a different assessment system. But within a market system where schools are doing very different things, um, whether you have a national curriculum, but if there's a need to kind of compare, this is the way you do it through assessment. Maybe in a less marketized culture, you could have much more modular portfolio types of assessment, much more teacher's judgments. But I've experienced the system in Sweden. And, you know, if you have a highly marketized system and assessments which are based on teacher judgment, then you get accused of greater inflation. And there's other issues with a lack of moderation. So, you know, the assessment system in some ways actually is designed um, for better or worse for the school system that we're currently experiencing. But the problem with that then, of course, is the high stakes accountability attached to it. And as we're seeing now in England, um, the pernicious effects of accountability on the key actors within the system. So the head teachers predominantly here, uh, we see through the tragic suicide of Ruth Perry, but also on teachers as well who, you know, are leaving the system, basically, because this is how assessment has been used to hold schools to account. It's quite interesting that these agendas that might be deriving from sort of certain global actors might be valuable and being prioritized by politicians for whatever reason truly do impact the teachers it shapes them it shapes how they see the world it shapes it impacts them physically and mentally emotionally and so it it has these huge agendas even in the case of Argentina as Ezekiel was sort of saying where it's being resisted it's still that is still shaping the way in which right teachers perform and act and behave in this world in your book you talk about how these agendas, when they come together, they they sometimes have to create these quote-unquote inclusion heroes. What did you mean by an inclusion hero? How can we understand this? You know, how does that impact teachers themselves? What we found in, in the interviews was that these recent agendas place significant demands on teachers, the inclusion agenda. We saw in all cases that teachers acknowledged that they had not been prepared for these changes. We had a lot of, of quotes somehow saying, Okay, the government changed the policy. Now we have to include more children. That's fine. We agree with that. But we have not been prepared for this. And this is the mantra that we found in in all the countries, I would say. And this fact led us to teacher training. How these teachers were prepared and how these teachers were trained and how they should be trained in the future. Yeah, and I think it's also not just a matter of initial teacher training, is it? It's also continuing professional development because what we're seeing over time as well is the nature of the student is changing. The students who are being included has changed. Students' needs, interests, diversities are changing over time. So how can teachers respond to this effectively? And there is a need to kind of think much more in the terms of kind of a lifelong learning journey for the teacher of how they can actually deal with these these changes in society. But also this is all being done within a, a context where funding is cut. Um, we are in a cost of living crisis in many countries. School budgets have been cut for over 10 years in England already. And the resources for special educational needs as one group, students with these needs, um, is particularly hardest hit. So in terms of their achievement within the system, whether that be through assessment, a formal assessment or not, you know, is hampered. We've got all these changes going on and demands of the global agendas for 
uh, you know, achievement or equity and excellence, which you, you could say kind of mirrors the whole assessment and inclusion agendas in some way, slightly. But where are the resources for this? Where are the financial resources and where are the human resources for schools? I agree. Teachers were perceptive to the inclusion challenges that they faced. However, they constantly repeat the, the lack of time as the main issue, a crucial one, that impede these uh, inclusive practices. For instance, I remember a, an English teacher saying, if teachers had more time, if we had kind of an extra 10%, Something like that, yeah? Because they pose the teachers in a dilemma because they can some support and agree this inclusive practice and this in inclusion for all. But at the same time, the structure is the same. They, they don't have an extra time. Yes, they have a new agenda with uh, new challenges and, and somehow they're not being prepared for this, but they don't have neither the time to make the differentiated instruction or planning or one-for-one -one instruction. So they, they, they are kind of somehow trapped in, in between this dilemma. Yeah, and time is a resource in itself, isn't it? I think something as well, I mean, that came from the Danish data. One head teacher talked about the importance of stopping the clocks, essentially, and essentially taking staff off timetable for an afternoon, once a week, once a fortnight, so they could actually sit together and collaborate around ideas or issues they were having to, to propose solutions within the classroom or to come up with new ways of approaching a certain student or a class. And I thought that was really interesting, that notion of just stopping time for a while and allowing teachers and the head teacher to breathe and just be able to work with the children instead of working with an agenda. That's really important. Having been a teacher myself, I do know the importance of time and how hard pressed it is. These challenges seem quite enormous. Time issues, funding issues, saying we want to be prepared, we want more training, we want all of this extra support, but yet not necessarily receiving it. But then being constantly told to be this inclusion hero, include everybody, make sure you have all these amazing practices for all these diverse types of students in your classroom, potentially. You can see how this is a serious dilemma. In the research, what do teachers do? Like, how do they end up solving this problem where they're on the one hand, they're told you must be an inclusion hero. But on the other hand, we're not going to give you any extra money to, you know, have the resources to do it. We're not going to give you more training. We're also not going to give you necessarily more time to be able to, to do all of this. So in the end, the teachers are sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. What do they do? How do they navigate that? That's a very interesting question. At least in Denmark and in Argentina, we found out that collaborative pedagogical practices were described as the crucial element to somehow deal with this in, with this inclusive agenda. Uh, professional collaboration, teamwork were considered kind of the key to deal with these challenges of inclusion. I think, yeah, also is that notion of community, and not only the community within the school, so the teachers and the head teachers and the students together, but also parents, the involvement of parents in these issues at school level and seeing community as much broader than the school site. Um, and we didn't actually interview parents or students, but they were very much present in our data. And I think, you know, the next step would be to raise the voices of students and parents in any kind of research, especially research that could lead towards policy recommendations on inclusion and assessment. Yes, what we found is, Alison said, when the community, when the values and the vision of the community, in the broader sense of community, is aligned, everything is easier for students, for teachers, for parents. And what was interesting in Argentina was something your data showed as well, um, Ezekiel, was on that notion of how they involve the community in assessment during the pandemic. Yes, one school that we were making interviews, they somehow one activity, one project was to make more gardens within the, the student houses and somehow was also a nutrition kind of natural science, social science. And, and actually with uh, during the pandemic, the, the health, the nutrition and, and the food was an issue and, and was a way that the, the principal and school was able to reach to, to the houses and, and show well here we still are here through this project and we're learning through it as well we're learning and we can assess your knowledge through this project and your mum and dad can be involved and your sisters and brothers can be involved i thought that was really something quite unique to the argentinian context maybe looking at some of the other contexts about some of these assessments and the pressure that might put on teachers. I'm sure some of the pressure from assessment can get pretty difficult to, you know, hope that your students end up 
scoring well on these assessments to reach the standards that the school gets ranked. So how did teachers sort of understand some of these pressures from the assessment agenda in these different contexts? What we found is that teachers perceived these tensions between somehow these pedagogical tasks, one of which was related to externally mandated assess and standardized tests, and the other to teachers' possibility to assess formatively. And some teachers, uh, well, share with us that this rise of data and the current kind of educational kind of data kind of movement somehow had led teachers to reflect nostalgically about the past. In the past, parents used to trust in our professional judgment. Now they see the league table or now they see the results of the standardized assessment. So they, they somehow they felt that this assessment somehow took them some authority. That's not a nice feeling for, for the professional self-esteem. What's really interesting is the word assessment and how very much at the start of this conversation even we focus very much on standardized tests, um, national standardized tests and international large-scale assessments. And actually, assessment is a much broader concept, and teachers know that. Teachers are trained to understand that assessment goes on before you, your students even enter the classroom. You're already assessing their learning needs. And it's that notion that assessment is much broader, but what the data, what the accountability tends to focus on is very much the summative, standardised assessment and the grades and what that means in terms of maybe progress or in terms of prognosis, future performance. I think that's also an issue for the, the teacher training, the teacher education, is that notion of how to negotiate these tensions, but also the fact that we need to lift teachers' capacities and confidence in their own professional judgment as assessors, as much as they are inclusive professionals as well. You know, they're both two areas where there, there needs to be a greater focus on their capacities and, and what they can contribute to children's development. Whenever I hear the word assessment, I think of examinations and tests and like my heart rate goes up a little bit. Like I get very, very nervous. I, I was always a terrible test taker. Well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, not everybody is good at taking tests and they can show their learning in many different ways. I think another thing that came through quite interestingly in the data was this notion of dialogue and how teachers can assess students much more qualitatively and have conversations with them about their progress and, you know, write qualitative texts on where they see their progress and where they're going. It doesn't have to be about a grade. It doesn't have to be such a, a label, something which, you know, distinguishes one person from another. And also, I mean, the issue with grading, obviously, as well, is a grade D for one child can be feeling a failure, but for another child, it can show they've exceeded, you know, their own expectations, their own self-belief through getting a grade D. And, but then wider society, industry, um, higher education puts a different value on that grade D, which has an impact then on that child's own self-confidence of feeling that that D was worth something. It's a very complex situation to be in, isn't it? Because assessment does allow for, again, for better or for worse, the identification of inverted commas talent, but it's talent based on a certain type of knowledge that is considered important for a certain context. And there are many talents that students have that are not assessed. And um, this is one of the challenges teachers have then, is knowing that they're putting their students through these assessments, but actually their students are also showing other capabilities, skills that will never get acknowledged in a certificate or a grade. Adding to Alison's comments, something that is, for me, it's extremely interesting is how teachers, we call in the book, metamorphose these assessment kind of emphasis say well we don't agree with this test with this standardized kind of craziness however it's a way to instill values on students of hard work perseverance and greed some of they say well we don't agree with the to such extent with this craziness about uh, assessment but it's a way that, that students will learn these other skills so interestingly these assessments are not anymore a screenshot of academic progress but are being used for another purposes in the classrooms, for teaching grit, resilience, building student personal traits to prepare them for the real life challenges. So it's interesting how this translation 
of this mandate of assessment is being enacted in the classrooms. It just seems like what you're beginning to explore here is really how these different agendas of, of assessment and inclusion, that they can sort of compete with each other, right? They can create these dilemmas for the teachers that are almost impossible to resolve on the one hand, but then maybe as Ezekiel is just saying is that potentially there's ways of sort of teaching these other skills through these assessment that can actually be quite valuable for students and potentially, you know, further the inclusion agenda, right? I mean, so it just seems like these two agendas that teachers are sort of being forced into and they're changing their practices, sometimes it ends up being contradictory. I think all teachers, certainly within our study, felt that assessment was important and it's part of teaching. It complements teaching, doesn't it? How can you know what to teach your students next if you don't know what they already know? It was never a case that any of the teachers felt it was irrelevant in any way. I think the issue is how these assessments are used within accountability structures, how the data is used, who has access to the data, how public this data is made. I mean, in Israel case, actually, the Ministry of Education was actually very much against the publication of test results in the National Standardised Test because they were concerned about how high stakes it would become as a result of that. But it was actually pressure from freedom of information movements and parents that led to this policy being implemented at the publication of data. They had pressure, it went to the High Court. And as a result of that, the Ministry of Education had to set up a website which produced their results. Um, and now these data are then used by the media and put into league tables by the media. And they can also then have an impact on house prices in the area. Um, so, you know, um, sometimes these forces are not necessarily coming from the state themselves. They're coming from other actors and parents want to know how their children are doing as much as, as teachers do sometimes. But again, it's how this data is then used by, for example, the media and, you know, estate agents, <laughs> um, which then kind of distorts the kind of reality a little bit and, and, you know, takes it away from actually what is this really about? It's about children's learning at the end of the day. It shouldn't be about how much the house costs down the road. So, and this is then, this then causes wider social segregation. So it has then an impact on Inclusion. If you have urban segregation, that has a knock on effect on who goes to the local schools. So it's very complex and very interwoven and not just necessarily assessment inclusion kind of intersection. There are multiple intersections with multiple agendas going on simultaneously here, of which these two genders kind of just play some roles, really. Yes, we have the example of China. Our examinations have a long tradition, centuries actually, are understood as a state kind of inclusive technology since they foster educational opportunities for rural students, these massive examinations. So I don't know why, but we tend to, at least at the beginning of the of, of our project, we tend to post these agendas as opposite, opposite agendas. And after the, the research, I would say that they are not opposite. It's, it's much more complex. And I would say that both agendas are growing, the inclusive agenda and the assessment agenda. In different ways, of course, with different, with different contexts, but it's not just a competition. Both agendas are growing and, and getting stronger in the educational space. Although the assessment agenda does tend to kind of take precedence, I would say. I mean, something that Christian has drawn attention to a lot, our principal investigator, is this notion that inclusion is often seen as a kind of fluffy concept particularly in the kind of post-Salamanca statement era where inclusion kind of became much more holistic kind of concept. It wasn't simply just about the inclusion of special children with special educational needs and disabilities in schools. It became much more about diversities and different types of diversities and how do we address everybody's needs um, in this wonderful kind of school community vision. But at the same time, you know, what does that actually mean in concrete terms and how is that enacted at local level? It can be interpreted very differently from school to school in one context you would have teachers and head teachers with different visions of what that inclusion agenda means and they had different policies and practices and procedures going on at school level even though there's a national policy a code of, of conduct for how this should be done at local level there is some agency there in how it's interpreted according to students needs but you know what does that mean then in terms of equal access and equal access to quality education at the local level. Does inclusion mean exclusion? Does that mean you take students out of the classroom and then bring them back as soon as they are able to? Does that mean having a, you know, a bespoke timetable for them? And obviously there are pros and cons with all these 
kind of interventions we're seeing at local level. So you can't really say there's a one size fits all for it. But, you know, it, it does have a kind of impact on what we understand as inclusion then, because it has just very different meanings for very different people. I was thinking that to some extent, the assessment agenda through the standardized and long scale assessment had this technology that is very powerful, kind of driving the educational agenda. I was thinking about how the inclusive agenda, which ways or which technologies would somehow push to the next step this agenda, this global agenda. So I think that that's a good kind of topic to think. It's a, such a fascinating sort of insight. Lots of, like you said, new questions to raise going forward, but also to see these two agendas not in competition, but having these sort of complex relationships that really begin to change the way teachers and, as you said, potentially how students and other actors live in the world. So really fascinating research. So congratulations on your new book. Alison Milner, Ezekiel gomez Caraday. thank you so much for joining Fresh Ed. Really a pleasure to talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alison Milner is an assistant professor at Alberg University, and Ezekiel gomez Caraday is an assistant professor at the University of San Andreas. Their new co-authored book is Educational Assessment and Inclusive Education. A transcript of today's interview with a selection of resources for further exploration can be found at freshheadpodcast.com. Please note that opinions expressed on Fresh Ed are solely those of the host or the guest interviewed, not Fresh Ed, which takes no institutional position. If you've liked what you've heard today, please rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews really do help. Fresh Ed's team includes Fatih Akhtas, Obafe Mian Gunle, Annabella Afroboteng, Phyllis Che Mensa, and Jose Neto. Original music for Fresh Ed was created by Digital Primate. Fresh Ed is an independently run podcast without advertisements and is made possible by the support of NORAG, Shakta Family Fund, and listeners like you. Please consider donating to Fresh Ed by visiting freshheadpodcast.com slash donate. Thanks for listening. I'm Will Brem, and I'll be back next week.